Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we're exploring the wonderful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England. We've decided to revisit the centre of the region and find some hidden gems, places that are not quite so famous, but still just as beautiful. You find us today in the little village of North Cerny. I hope I've pronounced that right. I've no doubt someone will tell me if I haven't. This has come as a surprise to us, this place, because we don't know all there is to know about the Cotswolds. But it is astonishing. This church is a real find. Even Pevsner, who is not prone to doing that kind of thing, suggests that this might be one of the best preserved churches in the whole of the Cotswolds. It's a magical place, and we're going to show you around. Come with me. What Pevsner actually says about the church is this. All Saints in North Cerny is, for many, the most attractive of all Cotswold village churches. Largely thanks to William Iveson Croom of Cerny House, who lived between 1891 and 1967, and whose benefactions from 1913 onwards filled the church with exquisite furnishings. These were mostly designed by F.C. Eden and are amongst his finest work. Frederick Charles Eden was an architect and a stained glass designer. He was born in Hove in Sussex in 1864. He worked on several church restorations, adding Anglo-Catholic interior embellishments, his earliest being at St. Protus and St. Hyacinth at Blisland in Cornwall, followed by the interiors of Holy Trinity Church in Eltham in Kent, and this one, All Saints Church, North Cerny. He was a leading authority on chancel screens in England and Wales. The basic structure of this building is 12th century, but signs of an earlier church were found here in 1912 during maintenance work. We know that after a fire in 1460, a major rebuilding took place, and towards the end of the 19th century, the much-favoured firm of Waller and Son, whom we've come across so many times in this area, restored the church again, adding the organ chamber. When we arrived here, we had a moment of disappointment when we discovered the porch door was locked, but fortunately we noticed a little sign on the wall directing us to the tower doorway. This was indeed open, and we entered the church through a tiny, narrow door into an informal and friendly room from which a worn and pretty stone spiral staircase led upwards to a locked door, probably the bell ringer's loft. This was a really good start. I love spiral stone stairs, even, as is usual, when they're closed to intruders like me. This room brought us through to the body of the church from the west end, under cover of a very deep first-floor gallery, whose access is from an outside flight of steps next to the porch. This was locked, but understandably so. Up to this stage, all the fun of the building had been architectural, and it didn't stop there. On each side of the chancel arch there is a squint. I really love these brilliant solutions to the fact that parishioners in the side chapels like to see what's going on in the nave. The north squint is just at eye level, but the southern one is a passage squint, through which I got a great deal of childish pressure walking. Most wonderfully, though, from this passage rose another stone spiral, which, when climbed, led to a rude loft, from which vantage point we got a unique perspective on this great church. And it's from here that we got a truly clear idea of the amazing contents for which this church is famous. The late 15th century octagonal font, the amazing pulpit, perhaps the finest in the Cotswolds from about 1480, the bowl of which is made from a single piece of stone 
and the elaborate carving is reminiscent of the door above the altar in Magdalen College Chapel, which we know to have been made by a Burford mason. Surely this was made by the same hand. The lectern, which came from the marine stores in Gloucester Dock, has a fifteenth-century Flemish eagle and a Spanish steel stand of about the same time. The reading desk was made in 1929 from sixteenth and seventeenth-century remnants. The main altar is made from the original medieval stone altar, which was discovered beneath the Lady Chapel floor, restored and re-erected in 1913. On the loft itself is an amazing Italian rude figure of Christ's crucifixion from around 1600. To be honest, I could go on for hours, but I think maybe this isn't the moment for that. Perhaps we will revisit this church one day and do a comprehensive piece for the benefit of those of you who will never be in a position to visit yourselves. But meanwhile, I suggest any of you who can should really try and come here and see for yourselves. We, however, thought we would have a glance at the house in which the benefactor of this church had lived, and to our extremely pleasant surprise, we discovered its gardens were open to the public. We couldn't resist, and went in to have a look. What a treat! The house just above the church is surrounded by a bowl of hillside, and a wonderful walled garden, along with woodland walks, a ruined chapel, an ancient ice house, make it one of the most gently peaceful places to visit I've seen in a while. We met locals in the garden who told us it had been a saviour for them during the hellish lockdowns of the last few years, and I certainly felt infinitely more relaxed after our visit. I have a feeling we met one of the family who owned the house, although she didn't say so. We asked around to see if it was okay to film and met a charming lady stocking up the food in the cafe. Somehow her confident attitude and friendly response suggested proprietorship. If so, she was a descendant, either directly or by marriage, of Sir Michael and Lady Angus, who bought the place in 1983. He was a highly influential man of business and warrants a Google search. For the measly sum of six quid, paid for in an honesty box by the potting shed, a wander through these gardens will take you back to the life of an English aristocrat of the early 20th century and earlier. It's absolutely wonderful. Just when you think this little village can't offer any more, you discover on exiting the road from behind the church but there is a pub opposite called the Bathurst Arms. Irresistible for us, to be honest. So for two days running, we stopped here for lunch and were treated to simple but delicious bar snacks and great local beer served to us by extremely friendly and helpful staff who were clearly enjoying their work. I'm sure that in the high summer when tourism is in full flight, this place will be extremely busy, but my guess is that they will handle it well and it will be enjoyable at any time. It certainly was on these days, in May 2023. I do hope you've enjoyed our little trip around North Cerny. It's been quite remarkable to be taken by surprise by this place. We've loved it. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can find us on all the normal platforms, of course. And visit our website, thecotswoldexplorer.co.uk, where you'll find details of all the other stuff we've done. We will see you again very soon, somewhere else in the Cotswolds. Bye.